Wait, remember Motor City? It was Disney XD's highly styled futuristic car racing extravaganza. Sick whips, cool visuals, and Mark Hamill. What else could you ask for in a show like this? Maybe a second season. Yeah, let's ask for that. It always seems like action shows, whenever they come out, always get the short end of the stick, either being mistreated and mishandled by the network, or just not getting the respect that a lot of them deserve. In the case of Motor City, it was a bit of everything, so today, I wanted to take a look back at Motor City, how this show came to be, and why I think it's highly underrated. So if you enjoy this video, you better subscribe. Let's shift into one of the coolest shows that Disney ever had, Motor City. See me for what I truly am, a follower. And don't forget, they're mandatory. In Motor City, we are introduced to a new, futuristic version of Detroit that is directly built on top of the old Detroit. It was dubbed Detroit Deluxe, and below, the real freedom is had in one of the last places that the evil Abraham Kane hasn't been able to get his hands on yet, Motor City, which is basically what remains of old Detroit. The billionaire Abraham Kane rules over Detroit Deluxe with a tight fist, imposing strict laws on the citizens that live there where car-related transportation is banned. Our main focus is on the defiant group called the Burners, a bunch of rebels who fight back against Kane from controlling Motor City as well. It's kind of funny when you think about this, Mark Hamill voices Kane, instead of being on the Rebel Forces side, <laughs> it feels intentional, but Mark Hamill is a master at voicing villainous characters, so either way, he elevates the character greatly as a believable antagonist. The leader of the Burners is Mike, voiced by Reed Scott, a 17 year old with the personality of a main protagonist. He's funny, he's kick butt, he plays it really cool, and he puts out this air of confidence that drives his will to take down Kane, no pun intended. Originally, he was working for Kane until he realized who he truly was, giving him a personal reason to fight against Kane, knowing firsthand what he has done and is capable of. There's Chuck, voiced by Nate Torrance. He's the smart one of the group, being the one who is an expert at computers and uses his hacking skills to aid in any situation the group faces. But at the same time, he's pretty much the least brave, constantly fearing doing anything while the rest of the burners make it look so easy doing dangerous missions nonchalantly. Julie, voiced by Kate Masucci, is the sneaky one, using her internship at Kane Co. as a disguise to gather inside information and have some eyes on the inside. But even more closer to Kane as a person as she is actually his daughter, but has no interest in the person he is and just like the rest of the Burners would like to stop him. Although the Burners are unaware of that fact, they have no cause to be suspicious as she's just as much in it with them. Dutch, voiced by Kel Mitchell, is also quite smart, being the Burner's technology guy, constantly upgrading the rides for the team, but he is very much a loner in his own right, not being as open to trust others and has a major distaste for Detroit Deluxe, with no desire to go back. But he puts his all into his passion, so you know that the whips in the show are given such care and treatment as often as he can do so with them, along with any tools in their arsenal that are worked on for the crew. And of course, there is Texas, voiced by Jess Harnell. He is the muscle, truly balancing out the team, with more impulsive and less thinking about a plan, propping him up as the number two in the burners, possibly becoming the leader whenever Mike would step away, while never questioning Mike as a leader. Texas offers some fun conversations with the rest of the burners, some great back and forth, but plays his role in the group with ease. While on the surface it may seem like each character fits some form of archetype, they play them with style and subtle notions that differentiate away from just being this person fitting this role. They all feel unique and necessary to be there sharing screen time and working together. But let's take a look into how this show came to be. There was something that guy said. He knows about me. We'll be right back to Motor City on Disney XD. Motor City. It's awesome. Motor City comes from the mind of Chris Pronosky, most famous for a bunch of other awesome shows like Mega's XLR and Downtown. Motor City was born from the concept 10 years prior to it coming out for Disney, having been pitching it with no bites until then. But for the show, once it was picked up, they wanted to really add something special to the look, hiring on Robert Valley to work on the character design. That's why these characters have this resemblance to the Gorillas, a virtual band that has always had a very distinct look and style. So in the landscape of 
animation on television, it truly stands out compared to the look of many other shows. The show was animated in Flash, showing how that no matter which way you create something, if you use it effectively, you can truly create something special. Going the extra mile to take the heads of the characters which look 2D like the rest of the show, but rendering them as full 3D objects that offer full visual perspective from the characters at any view, aiding in how smooth the show looks when all said and done. Chris urged the animation team to go wild and make it as polished and stylized as possible, giving us one of the best looking cartoons, period. When it would come to the writing, they wanted to create something that had true substance to it. Whereas Mega's XLR focused more on the fun of the action, Motor City wanted to combine engaging action with a deeply written narrative. Along with that is the comedy in the show, having it mainly come from the interactions between the characters, and the way things are said and the reactions some have to it. But as we will touch on later in this video, the show had one major issue, that issue being Disney and their treatment of the show itself. First, I must say one thing, as it is the first thing you can take away from the show right when you see it, the way it looks. It feels so unique to anything else out there at the time, and heck, even today, to a large extent. It feels like something new, something fresh that demands your eye's attention to take in every fluid and gorgeously animated movement the characters make. From the chill moments to the intense action scenes, the show never failed to visually stun your senses. While the action would be super fast, it was never hard to follow along with what was happening. It felt engaging and pulled you into why this visual style works so well. Built with a fusion of dark tones that contrast the vivid colors that would pour through the darkness gave life to both versions of Detroit that we see, especially between the futuristic land above and the falling apart city, or what's left of it, below. Adding in the characters we follow in the show, it really gives us some fantastic world building, where the world itself feels like a character. What I like about the car factor in the show is that the cars here feel like a character just as much as anything else for the show. Obviously, being the main vessel for the action in the series, they all just look so stylized and well-suited for the world the show creates. Motor City feels like it understands what it is and the story it wants to tell, giving a nice blend of great storytelling between fully fleshed out and unique characters and impressive action sequences that will have you at the edge of your seat as they play out. Even side characters that we spend time building up and focusing on feel so well put together, like Jacob, another character that worked directly with Kane but ultimately saw the evil inside of him, driving him down to be in Motor City with the rest of our other main characters. He plays a supporting role, giving some wise words to the Burners. He knows what he's talking about and offers some great perspective for everyone. I spoke in my Mega's XLR video about the character of Goat and how this real-life person who was a friend played themselves across several shows. But this character of Jacob isn't officially Goat, it still is in some ways resembling that character, honoring a friend and I think that's pretty cool. In fact, a lot of people we meet, specifically from Detroit Deluxe, who are somewhat involved with working for Kane, having some form of relationship or connection to the others down below, giving the Burners a lot more deeper character development and personal stakes attached to what they do. There's these other characters that truly flesh out the world, like other Rebel Force groups, like Terra, that lived on the outskirts of both Detroits and are labeled as an eco-friendly group, with reasonings behind this being originally where they lived was destroyed by Kane Co.'s dumping of toxic waste, causing those who lived there to have mutated facial features and now hide their faces under gas masks, but for them, the revenge on Kane Co. goes beyond just them, as they also set up attacks on anyone in Detroit Deluxe, meaning even the innocent citizens get hurt and Terra doesn't worry about who is in their way. Or there is the eccentric Duke of Detroit, who brings this level of flair to the show that goes above and beyond to be such an entertaining figure, parading around as this massive rock star figure who, unlike most in these worlds, has money and flaunts it in others' faces. He goes between being another antagonist for the Burners and being a frenemy, giving respect to the Burners when he feels they've earned it. Motor City feels alive because these characters and supporting characters building up some incredible lore for this series that gets you into this world and interested in the stories and conflicts that take place over the show's 20 episodes. But with how great I and so many others think this show is, why did it only have 20 episodes? What ended the show's run so early? Let's take a look at how Disney handled this show. This isn't gonna be good. Yeah, but it'll be entertaining. Watch Motor City, only on Disney XD. The Burners are always on the move.
Fifth Motor City originally premiered on April 30th, 2012, with the show lasting for one season ending on January 7th, 2013, only producing 20 full episodes of the show. It wasn't for a lack of quality because, I mean, come on, just look at the show, it's gorgeous. And there was a fan base building up because of these characters, this setting, and the beautiful animation. But Disney, for whatever reason, decided to promote this show as little as possible, seemingly feeling like they were hiding its existence from the world, giving it earlier slots of airtime rather than prime time, meaning catching an episode is a lot harder to do, shifting it around at times, making it even harder, but what made it the hardest was the order in which they aired the show. Since there is a through-line narrative to the show, seeing it in order especially for character introductions and episode pacing for the story was a crucial reason on why the show flows so well from episode to episode, how we look into individual main characters and how side characters are introduced. But for Disney, why would they care? Aside from the beginning and the end of the series, the show had so many episodes shifted in between that made the show a lot more confusing even if you were able to catch an episode on the channel. Mix all of that with a long hiatus for the show, as well as during the hiatus, the rest of the series accidentally leaked from Disney Online, but was quickly hidden once more, but the internet, the internet. So these episodes were spread around really fast, all of this resulting in the cancellation of the show on November 5th, 2012, with the remaining episodes being shown on TV until it officially finished them out. Fans of the show were crushed and have since had to carry the greatness of the show on their shoulders to get people interested in it, ultimately in hopes that Disney would take notice of the many petitions and efforts to get the show to come back, or give the IP back to Titmouse so they can handle other forms of bringing it back. But Disney has since just sat on the show, never really doing anything more with it than the original run, in ways seemingly hiding it from existence, as if Disney themselves, or at least one person who was higher up in charge not liking or ever liking what the show was. Or maybe they just didn't see the performance from it they wanted viewership-wise when it first was coming out. But once again, that would be their fault for how they released the show and what times they did. It's pretty sad to see this. Any show being treated this poorly by a network sucks to see. And with Chris Pranowski especially, as this wasn't his first rodeo with networks treating his creations poorly. Honestly, all three major networks screwed his works over, with Downtown for MTV, which was under Viacom, who also owns Nickelodeon, then with Megas XLR with Cartoon Network, and now here with Disney and Motor City. Chris just has such a great talent for making some incredible shows, so it hurts to see this happen to another show of his. Motor City was truly a special cartoon. It had action, it had cars, and it had heart, wrapped in a beautiful art style that gives this show some extra soul. I do think that this show deserved a lot better, and I'm happy that the fan base for the show has grown through the show spreading out to others since its cancellation. So if you never watch this show, I urge you to seek it out, especially if you're a fan of Chris's other work. But if you have seen it, let me know your thoughts on Motor City in the comments as well as if you'd like to see another season of the show one day come to fruition. Thanks so much for watching, like and subscribe, later.